Hey everyone, welcome to Metaphysical Mining. My name is Michelle Javries. For this episode, Jerry Morzinski is back and he's brought another guest with him. We're going to take you on a mystical journey through the eyes of a former schizophrenic. The guest is going by the pseudonym Anon Amas to hide his identity from his professional peers. Anon is a mechanical engineer who battled schizophrenia in his 20s and came out the other side healed and balanced. He recounts his journey over the past 30 years, which includes his time in a psychiatric facility, and he shows a vivid slide presentation depicting the elaborate vision which completely turned his life around. Anon has published a book called Revelations on Interstellar Highway 10 based on his religious, spiritual, and mystical experiences. The book was written over a period of three decades and takes you through a sampling of several religious and scholarly perspectives of other God seekers while leading you on a journey of awakenings. The book is suitable for Orthodox, Gnostic, and other travelers. It blends elements of science, history, psychology, mythology, and religion into an amalgam of thought that will stretch the reader's imagination. Visit asteroxrising.com to purchase the book and read Anon's blog. As a reminder, you can purchase Jerry's book anywhere books are sold. It's titled An Amazing Journey into the Psychotic Mind, Breaking the Spell of the Ivory Tower. Visit jerrymarzinski.com to contact him and browse his extensive library of free resources. All right, I'm excited for this one, so let's get on with it. the fourth time now jerry that you'll be on the show and this is the second time that you're bringing someone i'd like to do just do a little preamble get us rolling how about it the floor is yours okie doke well my name is jerry marzinski and i've been working on the front lines of mental health my entire career i've worked in state hospitals I've worked in the psychology department of a large prison. I've worked in mental health centers. I've worked in the emergency rooms for my last 10 years doing psych crisis. And over those last 40 years, I've been studying the voices that schizophrenics hear. Those things that the psychiatric mafia insists are hallucinations. And when I first got to the Sense State Hospital I started at, um, I spent seven years there. The place was humongous. It was the size of a city. It's probably the biggest psychiatric hospital on the planet. Everybody there was convinced that the voices schizophrenics were hearing were hallucinations. They already felt they knew that. There wasn't a single one of them that I saw that was curious about the voices. They all thought they were hallucinations, and they'd been programmed to believe that in nursing school, in medical school, in psychology classes. Where did that come from? It didn't come from any research. It came from a declaration made by the psychiatric mafia that because these things appeared to be hallucinations, that's what they were. They had no substantial evidence for that at all. They've done no research over it, and it's completely false. So here's the chief symptom of paranoid schizophrenia, the main symptom, the voices. And they've done no studies on them at all. None. They're not even curious about them. They don't even ask what these voices say. And when schizophrenics try to tell a psychiatrist what the voices are telling them and try to convince them that they're very real, they're just blown off. And if they can, if they insist, then they're drugged senseless. The psychiatry doesn't even listen to these people that just blows them off like they're imbeciles or insane people. And they have nothing to say, nothing to teach them that, that anything they have to say about their disorder is garbage because they know it all. They don't know crap. These voices are entities. They're negative, parasitic, invisible entities. They are not of the physical realm. They're not material. There's no space or time where they come from. Now, now psychiatry doesn't want to hear any of this, but they have no idea what causes paranoid schizophrenia. So they made them up. First, they started with the genetic stuff. That was proved wrong. Then they started with the chemical brain imbalance. That was proved wrong. 
and they wigged out. They're desperate to find a physical cause for paranoid schizophrenia to justify their medications and their status as doctors. They have no idea what causes paranoid schizophrenia right now, none. And that's embarrassing for them. All they know is that their medications don't cure anything. They suppress psychotic symptoms and they sedate schizophrenics. That's it. They don't have a cure. They don't know what causes it. They don't have a cure. It's the voices that cause paranoid schizophrenia. Once the voices are gone, all the symptoms of paranoid schizophrenia disappear with them. You know, now I've gone over a number of times. I'm going to quickly repeat them again. These things are energetic entities. So you can't see them. You can't feel them. They're like, if you look at a magnet, there's a magnetic field around a strong magnet. You can't see it, you can't feel it, you can't touch it, you can't hear it, you can't sense it. Right? The only re way you know that it's there is maybe get a jar of iron filings, put the magnet on there, and then you can see the magnetic field. Well, it's the same thing with the voices. These are energetic entities. Their manifestations in physical reality are the following. They are negative. They're anti-religious. They create and foster negative emotion. They energetically drain their victims. They get louder after sunset. They get louder if ignored. They foster self-destructive behavior. They foster isolation. They demand the attention of their victims. They maneuver for increased control over their victims. They gaslight their victims. They manipulate perception. They have complete access to the schizophrenic's memory. They demand the victim not tell anybody about them. Uh, they're consummate liars. You can't believe anything they say. You can't make any bargains with them. They won't keep them. They're cons they consistently steer their victims away from anything that might generate joy. Their voices can manipulate feeling without speaking. They short-circuit reason. They take advantage of boredom. They try to pass themselves off as the thoughts of the victim. So we're told from the time we're born that every thought that comes into our head belongs to us. That's far from true. These voices do not come from the schizophrenic. They do not belong to the schizophrenic, and they're not a part of them. They foster selective forgetting. They fill the victim's head with negative thoughts about themselves and others. They destroy any positive self-concept. They attempt to pull their victim away from consensual reality. They use confusion as a means of instilling negative suggestions. They are averse to anything positive or beautiful. They rebel when you try to tell the victim that they are energetic entities. And they react very negatively to the 23rd Psalm or any Bible verse. You know? And and here's, you know, the psychiatric mafia. They won't even listen to these people. They won't even listen to their stories. You won't find their stories in any psychology classes. You won't find them in the psychology books. All they say is, oh, these are hallucinations. There's nothing you can do about them. Their brains are broken. This is a life sentence. It's like Dante's Gate to Hell, where it says, and anybody who enters here, leave all hope behind. What they're feeding you is a crock of crap. These voices are energetic entities. And what I've been doing is bringing on people who are willing to talk about them, who've gone through the process, who've experienced these voices, unlike the psychiatric mafia, and who've come out of it and are cured or cured themselves. And one of them is Anon Anonymous below. So what I'm going to do is turn it over to Anon. And then I'll just jump in every once in a while to point out stuff that he's missed or to highlight these negative symptoms. Now, these things are very clear. Anybody who's working with schizophrenics, anybody who has one at home, you can see these things for yourself. They're not hidden behind any kind of complex statistics or all this scientific bullcrap with numbers and graphs and all that kind of stuff. These are out in the wide open. You can see them for yourself. All you got to do is look. Go ahead, and It's all yours. Okay. Oh, greetings all. I consider myself a recovered schizophrenic. I'm one of the lucky ones. I got through based on approaching it more as a spiritual battle rather than purely madness of, of the mind. Now, I introduced myself to Jerry Marzinski about a year ago. I touched base with him because I saw the great work that he was doing on behalf of advocating for the schizophrenic patient. And I've never been a patient of Jerry's because I went through my schizophrenic episode, I say about 30 years ago, primarily in my mid twenties. I haven't been on any psychiatric, psych psychotropic medications related to schizophrenia 
since at least 1992. My story begins, I graduated college with a degree in mechanical engineering, and this would have been about 1989, 1990. And I had some time to myself finally. I wanted to start investigating religious aspects of the Bible on my own to kind of read it, interpret the way I thought it should say without any middlemen. I mean, I was baptized Greek Orthodox. I went to a Methodist Sunday school throughout elementary school, and I was in a Roman Catholic youth group throughout high school. So I really just beliefs. Uh, I wouldn't say that my family was, was super religious or anything like that. It was more just the idea of you know, being a good person. And of course, you went through all the stories in the Bible when you're in the Sunday school at the Methodist church, like coloring Noah's Ark with crayons and that sort of thing. So I wanted to kind of read the Bible on my own to see what it was really about. So I started reading the New Testament and the Old Testament. And I was trying to decide, you know, what type of person I was going to be, what type of career path I wanted to head down. Even though I had a degree in mechanical engineering, I was kind of trying to have some questions in life. And I was trying to figure them out. And I found myself going kind of inward into myself at the same time. I came from a dysfunctional family, and every family has a degree of dysfunctionality, some more so than others. But what was happening, I was starting to acknowledge the degree of dysfunctionality that I grew up in. And I think a lot of things were all coming to a head simultaneously. I think suppressed emotions were waking up. Uh, I was dealing with some, some issues related to my family dynamics. And as I started to kind of read the Bible a little bit, I, I started to feel like I was losing my sense of self-worth. Like something was making me feel very worthless. Like I had no, uh, no worth, nothing to offer the world, humanity. And it would, uh, it, 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 I guess it got worse and worse and worse, I would say, to, to the point of where I started to become very depressed. I felt like I wasn't worthy to have friends, that like nobody would, would, would talk to me, that I had no value to anybody. And I think I got to the point that I was so depressed that I started seeing black and white. I couldn't see colors anymore. Food lost all flavor. So essentially, I was going through a psychological crash. Um, one could also refer to it from a religious aspect as the dark night of the soul. Uh, as presented by St. John of the Cross. So what was happening? It was weird. There were times where it almost felt like something was trying to take over my personality or psyche. And what I did to kind of deal through this is, is I, I had to kind of go into a state of a split mind where one part of me was the participant, the target or the victim dealing with this stuff. And the other part was kind of the scientific observer, you know, the curious, taking mental notes of what was going on. So I was very aware of, of what was occurring at the time. And it reached a point where I almost, like, I almost felt like I was fighting something that was trying to take me over or my personality over. And I remember I had trouble getting words out. There was a time where I would try and speak and I couldn't get the words out. It was come, it would come out something like this. Uh, like I was trying to talk and I couldn't. Something was preventing me from saying anything or it was like a fight for my, I guess, my use of my vocal cords. And there were times I remember my arms and legs were moving on my own and I wasn't one moving them. Like I remember my arm would lift up a little bit or move this way or that way. And I wasn't the one, I didn't feel like it was me moving it. Now, I had taken general psychology, comparative psychology, and abnormal psychology in college. So I knew about DSM and the various mental disorders or the classification, so to speak, of you know, bipolar, a manic depressive, schizophrenia. And when I started undergoing some of the, the, these occurrences, I was saying, wow, you know, I've read about this stuff in the textbooks, but it feels way different than the way they're describing it. This, this, is, this can really be referred to almost as a attempt at possession, I would say, is, is the way it felt. And I reached a point where I, I wasn't sleeping at all. Like these negative thoughts would start occurring and it make me feel so guilty for my existence. Like I didn't deserve to exist. They would, and these negative thoughts would occur quite often. You'd wake up about two, three o'clock in the morning, just in, in a state of like a, even say panic depressiveness, I guess, for lack of a better word. And it reached a point where 
I think my whole body was shaking and thrashing. Like I wasn't moving it on my own. And I ended up in the emergency room of a hospital because they weren't sure if it was something uh, physical, like a tumor or something like causing it. So they concluded that it was psychological, not physiological. And I was admitted to a psychiatric hospital. Uh, it was Princeton House in New Jersey, to be specific. I was there for four weeks in the fall of 1990. I was diagnosed with having affective schizophrenic disorder. Now, I remember they had put, they were giving me all these different drugs to try in, in the little paper cups, um, this combination, that combination, multicolored ones, circular ones. And you're basically a human guinea pig because they don't know which drug is going to work on you. And I heard all the same usual stuff that Jerry talks about, like, oh, it's a chemical imbalance. It's, oh, it's genetic. And I remember when the doctors are asked, said it's a chemical imbalance, we have to figure out how to straighten out. I said, well, what's the baseline supposed to be? And I just got dumbfounded looks. I mean, I took chemistry. I understand, you know, when you monitor the pH in your pool, you know what the acid or the base levels are, and you know where it should be. But, you know, with the brain chemistry, if it's a chemical imbalance, well, then there should be some baseline of indicators of where your brain chemistry should be. There's no point of reference for this stuff. All right. The truth is they have no evidence for a chemical imbalance. It's been disproved. But they that was made up by one of the pharmaceutical industries looking for some reason why their drugs work. They're desperate to find a physical reason for schizophrenia so they could become real doctors like doctors who treat diseases. But they can't find one because there is no physical reason for schizophrenia. And the... Um, intrusive thoughts that Anand was talking about, that's what the voices sound like. They sound like your own thoughts. They're intrusive. They go through and they're negative and condescending and just awful, awful thoughts. But they, for the most part, they sound like your own thoughts. But the content is not something that you would think about. You know, they're negative on the person. They're negative on everybody around you. They put everybody down. They put you down. They're consistently negative and they lie about everything. I have a question, okay. Anon, real quick. Before you continue, when you went to the emergency room, they ran tests to figure out, was this something that is medically wrong, you know, physically? And then whenever you were admitted into the state hospital, did they run any more blood work or any type of scans or anything like that? Or was it just talking and assessing it that way? No, they did run, I believe it was either a PET scan or a CAT scan. They did run a scan of the brain. Okay. I, I, I do recall them doing that. Um, but I remember in the emergency in the hospital, I, mean, I remember I was just kind of moving around. It wasn't on my own. It was like I was thrashing and I couldn't control it, uh -huh. uh, shaking. And I, I remember I felt very afraid and frightened, of course. I didn't know what was going on. And the emergency room staff really couldn't do anything about it. I just, they just kind of left me there for the most part. And I was fortunate enough, I, had, I still had health insurance at that point in time. So I was able to go to a, uh, it wasn't a state psychiatric hospital at the time. It was actually, I don't, I don't know if it was private or it was probably, it was probably a for-profit hospital, but it wasn't a so-called state institution. Okay. So I was admitted into the psychiatric ward of Princeton House. Yeah, so, so to regress a step here, when, when a psych patient goes into the emergency room, they do run medical procedures to see if they can find a medical cause okay. before they turn it over to psychology to, or yeah. psychiatry. That's to what that. I was trying to get at is, so everything was ruled out before yes. you that, went in. So that, that, so almost like, so by the time you get to whatever facility hospital, they don't, Jerry, do they just, they don't really do any other diagnoses other they than have, they, they talk. They, they have yeah. none. Okay. So, do any more blood work? They don't run any more scans. They no, they uh, have they have no tests okay. for any one of those two hundred and ninety five okay. or so diagnoses, psychiatric diagnoses that they put in the DSM so that all were completely fabricated. Like, once you get in there, it's all talking with you. It's you giving them information, them assessing it and determining it. That's it. It's all Sub just talking. That's what I want everybody to understand. Yeah, it's all subjective at that point. Once Definitely. all the medical, physical stuff is ruled out, then from there, like you said, Jerry, it's just subjective. It's a, it's, it's a crapshoot. And if you, yes. you gave 10 psychiatrists, you, you put a patient in front of 10 of them, 
and with not real clear symptoms, you'll get 10 different diagnoses. If you end up in this psychiatric ward, you're to the point where everything else has been ruled out and then anon what happened with you, it's really good to have the other side um, perspective of what happens within this scenario. Yeah, and it, as Anand will tell you, I mean, the way the psychiatrists treat you there, it, they spend very little time with you. You know, you hear in voices, oh, you're schizophrenic. You know, they had very little time. Yeah, it was about 20, I think I saw an actual psychiatrist about 20 minutes every couple of days when I was in there for, wow. for the four weeks. There'd be group yeah. therapy and, you know, some of the, the staff, you felt like they were trying to truly help you. They had compassion. Others, not so sure. Yeah, and if you try to convince them that the voices are real, which they are, you're going to get medicated even more, you know, until until you shut up. You know, and that's so it the probably only... takes a person a while to figure out the way in which things happen. And on whenever you first went in, you probably were thinking that you were going to get some type of help. I was at rock bottom. I felt like my life was going to go nowhere after this. Uh, you know, going back, yeah, they do the blood work on you when I initially before you go in because they want to rule, rule out any kind of foreign chemical yeah. substance, not doing yeah. drugs or that sort of thing. Because um, I remember the hospital had three wings. One was for those who had chemical de dependency issues. One was for those with, with mental issues. And one was for those involved in research studies for new drugs and that sort of thing. And oftentimes patients admitted in the wing that were on chemical substances ended up on the wing for those with mental issues because wow. oftentimes addiction is just to cover up for some of these mental issues. And, you know, as far as uh, when I was in the hospital, they kept asking, you know, are you hearing voices? Are you hearing voices? And part of me was hesitant to say yes, because I, I kind of knew that it would change where I would go. So I, I, would, I would say yes with a caveat and say, yeah, I'm hearing voices, but it's just my mind playing tricks on me. You know, it's just, it's, I'm, I'm kind of in a dreamlike state. It's just, it's just that I'm just ignoring them though. You know, I, I didn't make it out like it was a big deal to them. But I remember there was a period about 48 hours when I was in the hospital where I was hearing auditory hallucinations intensely. Um, it was the sound of men's, women's, and children's voices. It, it came across. It was almost like a cacophony. Uh, if you ever, you know, when you're sitting in a movie theater before the show's about to start and everybody has their own little conversations going on, that's what it felt like. And I don't know if the voices at the time were talking about me. In particular, I was trying to ignore them because I mean, you're getting bombarded by this stuff. And throughout this whole ordeal, I was going back and forth on whether are these my own thoughts or is this something external? I was on the fence back and forth. Well, I'll tell they... you, that's critical to make that decision. Some people never make it. If they don't make it, they're not going to recover. They'll be on drugs the rest of their life. But yeah, the, the, and the first step to recovery is, is finding out that those voices don't belong to you that they're separate from you. And if you don't come to that conclusion, you're not gonna recover. That's one of the questions that I had was, when did you realize that the voices were separate from you? Did you do that from the very beginning or did you No, take it actually came with the, the, the one and only, I'll say vision or visual hallucination that I've ever had in my life. That was the turning point. Because I'll, I'll get into that later on. Okay. It's actually, it actually a, a visual hallucination that occurred that was the turning point that said, wow, this is definitely something external to myself. This is not just madness going on in my head. Um, I mean, I come from a scientific background. I was a mechanical engineer. I, I worked with the wor world of logic and reason. But these occurrences that I was going through, they defied logic. I mean, it was it's something that a lot of the, you could say, the, the ancient religious sects and the various scriptures talk about. And it's Anand's logic that, that saved his butt. Yeah. And, well, go ahead and recount that how how you how you ferreted out. Oh boy! So uh, with logically, that these things weren't you. So I was in the hospital, and uh, oh, and, and as Jerry mentioned, they make you these entities. I'll call them uh, thought entities, whether they're egregores, and they could be both internal and external of us, or they're external and working internally through us. But I remember. A group of people were there and they invited me over to come just join the group. It was just kind of, it was just socializing. I was so shocked that somebody would actually want to talk to me or have me part of the group because these voices kept telling me how worthless I was, how nobody would like me, how you don't deserve their friends. Did they all think that you're a fool and, and, and an imbecile? I mean, all these certain negative thoughts that you get bombarded with. 
So nothing was working. None, all the different drugs that they gave me, none of them were, were snapping me out of it, so to speak. It, it's almost like I was an old vinyl record needle stuck in a groove. And I couldn't get out of it. There, there was so much noise going on in your, in your head because you're being bombarded by these voices and these uh, uh, attacks of these par as parasitic entities, as, as what Jerry refers to them as. And I was reaching the point there where my health insurance was about to run out. Uh, I was going to be sent over to a state institution. None of the, the drugs were working. The drugs are awful. I mean, it's not something you want to take. They make your mouth so dry to the point that you can't, you can't even, you can barely swallow or talk. Some days I was totally out of it where I had no memories at all because they just totally blank you out. Sometimes I remember being on it where I couldn't communicate the outside world, but all those internal thoughts and entities were still kind of attacking, working it on my mind, but I couldn't express myself to the outside world because I, was, because I was tranquilized. And I remember at times I would be looking somewhere, I'd turn my head and the scenes would go and shift to catch up to what I was looking at. Like it totally distorts your sense of reality and vision being on some of those drugs. And I, I wasn't, I wasn't violent or anything like that. I wasn't out to, out to hurt anybody. I actually got a little hurt in there when I, when I was in the psychiatric hospital. I believe it's not, not a fun place to be. So I reached the final week or so. My, my health insurance stuff went out. They decided to resort to electroconvulsive therapy because nothing was working. That's ECT, of course, where they put the electrodes on your scalp. They give you muscle relaxant and anesthesia. To knock you out and it's almost like going into surgery now they have to give the muscle relaxant because if they don't due to the electrical jolt of the, the brain you can have convulsions and seizures end up you know breaking bones breaking tendons and that's why they give you the muscle relaxant so that doesn't happen now i remember the very first procedure counting back from 10 and going 10 9 8 i think turning the anesthesia on to knock you out and they had to give you a respirator too to breathe for you because the muscle relax is so strong that your diaphragm can't go up and down and your lungs won't move on their own. So you're, you're, you're totally helpless there when they give you the muscle relaxing. But I gotta tell you, it worked for me. The very, after the very first session, I felt better. I mean, I felt like myself, my mind was calm. I didn't have all of these internal voices and thoughts running rampant in, in my head. Um, I felt like, you know, I can rebuild myself from heal. I, I felt like I was, I, was at, I was still rock bottom, but I felt like I was at a point where I could start rebuilding myself as a human being and get my identity back. And of course, the staff, I told the staff, look, I feel much better. I said, I don't need any of this again. I'm ready to kind of start working on myself and get myself back here. And they're like, no, 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 you need at least six treatments. So oh they gave me three inpatient ECT sessions and three outpatient ECT sessions. So the total of six ECTs. It's interesting that ECT is electrical, which is energy. And what I saw at the state hospital is kind of something similar. An ECT, which is brutal back then, will would drive away the voices for days before they would come back. Yeah, it was temporary. I'll, I'll say that much. So, but if I hadn't gone through those ECT sessions, I would have been sent to a state psychiatric hospital. And I don't think I, I would have ever recovered or pulled myself out of what, what I was going through. So in a sense, it, it, it saved me. It, it really did. And yeah, it, it definitely affected short-term memory. And, and they told me that in advance, my short-term memory would be off for, for a, a few days. And I know from what Jerry said that it actually does some degree of neurological damage every time you get one of those. So I was released from the Princeton house. I was assigned a psychiatrist and a psychologist. One was acting as a counselor and the other one was prescribing medications for me. And I was being, I was put on a low dose of clonopin. Uh, I think it was a, I'd have to say, I believe it was 150 milligrams or something to that extent. I, I still have all my old records, as a matter of fact. So I, I showed Jerry some of them just to, just to uh, kind of prove my case and show him what I went through. And I mean, I hated being on the clonopin. I, I, I'm the type of person I'd rather be in control of my own faculties. I don't, I'd rather not have to rely on a chemical substance to, to kind of keep, keep my reality straight now. But they, they told me it was a mood stabilizer is what it was referred to as. So I was seeing a counselor at the time. Now there were a lot of issues going on. Uh, I mainly focused on some codependency issues that I currently have with my mother that I was try trying to break away from, but there was so much else going on. And 
after I was out, something started occurring with the thoughts from approaching late fall, early winter of 1991. And all of a sudden, I'm being offered this deal of access to instantaneous wealth, power, fame, fortunes. If I kind of gave up my quest or if I so-called sold my soul to this thing. Now, these, these are the voices making you this offer. And, you know, here it was. I was reading the Bible kind of on my own for the first time. You know, I read some of the New Testament, what Jesus Christ went through. And then I'm kind of getting a similar offer. And I'm thinking, my mind, I'm saying to myself, well, I really am, man. I'm a lunatic. You know, I, I read the Bible, and now I'm, my mind is playing tricks on me by making me the same offer. And so I, I'm going back with my head. You know, I, I, I'm a lunatic that my mind is broken and fractured, or that I'm going through some sort of profound spiritual battle, you might, you might say. So I, I kept going back and forth on that, but it kept, it kept off me. It made this offer. And I was in a, in a broken state. I mean, I, I, I was unemployed. My income that year was below poverty level. I'm dealing with the diagnosis of having affective schizophrenic disorder. I'm, I'm trying to get started in my life. I'm in the 20s. I graduated three, my, my engineering degree. I'm trying to get out there and establish my life, get career going. And I can't because I'm, I'm facing all these internal turmoil of the mind, so to speak. So this entity or entities kept making this offer. Um, and then they showed me how to do it. I mean, they gave me a business model of how to get there, you know, to have vast material riches and wealth and everything. But I, I would have to essentially sell my soul to it. In other words, have no sense of morality, no sense of morals, um, just be, being very narcissistic, I would say, to, to get to that point. And it was tempting, but I told them, no, I, I'm not going down that route. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to sell my soul to you. I mean, and I, I was having a difficult time dealing with these experiences. It's like, who, who do you tell about this stuff? And with my counselor, I didn't want to tell her that I was dealing with these additional voices and thoughts because I knew they would put me on harder drugs and I don't, and I didn't want to go down there. I felt like this was something I had to get through myself. This was my own spiritual battle. I had to fight it on my own. So the next, I would call them trial or tribulations is kind of what it, what it seemed where I was, it's almost like I was facing an adversary or a prosecutor within my head you know you have the angel on one side the devil on the other and ex prosecuting attack and i felt like i was going up some sort of managerial hierarchy because these parasitic entities seem to be different different ones in, in each attack because they use different vocabulary different tones of voices like, like, like there was a shift there, there was a change so i don't necessarily feel like it's always the same one or it could have been a subset of a, of a greater entity. I'm not quite sure on that. So the next one was trying to make extreme guilt my existence. Um, it would show me things that I'd done, any sin or questionable morality act in my life, even those minor things. And I remember the ones that kept pointing to me was that I used to go fishing as a kid and I would bait the hook with an earthworm to go fish for trout or bass or sunny to that sort of thing. These entities kept telling me what a horrible being I was for killing an earthworm. It would say things like, see, you talk morality and this is what you do. And it was making me feel extreme guilt for having done that, for having killed earthworms when I went fishing. And it, was, it would say things like, you're worthless for doing that. You should just kill yourself. You don't deserve to exist. And part of what I was going through, I didn't feel like I was just defending myself against these attacks. I felt like I was kind of act as an advocate for humanity or a defense attorney for humanity. Yeah, so to go back one step, is these things, it's common. They can enter the victim's mind. They can pull up every rotten thing they've ever done, and they can rub it in their face and make them feel guilty until they generate the negative emotional energy that they feed off of, and then they draw it off. And the victim can actually sense in a lot of cases that their energy disappearing that they just suck it off so they are parasitic but they have to turn the emotional state negative before they can draw that energy out and everything they do is aimed at turning that emotional state negative negative. and it was a morality issue where they felt like they could attack my morality as a person as a being that you promote peace and yet you kill earthworms type of thing and that's what they focused on that that wasn't one of my, my greatest mortal sins so to speak and I started 
and they would go on other things too. They would point out every morsel of meat that I ever ate, every ant or fly that I'd ever killed in my life. And sometimes they would actually show you scenes of when you did it too. I remember seeing that in my head. And any flaw in my character, they would throw it at me, anything to induce some sort of negative reaction to it. And I started defending myself against these attacks. Again, I didn't know if this was just my mind playing tricks on me or if this was something internal, external of me. I kept going back and forth. So I took a spiritual, religious approach to these attacks. Even though I'm a mechanical engineer, I still drew upon my faith a little bit to deal with this stuff. I started defending myself. I said, God created me with teeth, tongue, and mouth. Do I not have the right to use them? Why is meat made to taste flavorful and provides the most amount of proteanic energy per volume? And I said, why does God encourage some animals to kill and eat other animals with sustenance? How can you judge me this way when animals do the same thing? And I said, take your arguments to God, not to me. So these enemies will keep attacking me with these different trials, tribulations, torments. And it would go on for about maybe a month and a half each time. And then there'd be a, the next trial of tribulation. And one was like, like extreme doubt. It would tell me that you can't tell anybody about us because they won't listen to you. They'll just think you're a mad lunatic. They'll only laugh and mock you. That's common too. They tell everybody, don't tell anybody about us because they'll lock you up. They'll drug you. Nobody will believe you. You'll look like a lunatic. Don't tell anybody. So th they want to keep it sealed up. They don't want you telling anybody you can get support from. And what they hate is to be mocked, to be made fun of. They can't stand that. And, but they were partially true there because if I had told my counselor, oh, I'm hearing these voices, they're, they're, they're saying negative things to me, they would have put me on harder drugs. Yeah. So in a sense, these entities were kind of truthful in that aspect. And I, I kind of, and as I said, I didn't like being on the con. I want to be off all drugs. I want to face this on my own. I wanted to regain my, my sense of reality, my stable mind. Then the next Archonic attack, I use the word Archon, you call them demons, you call them parasitic entities. Um, if you take a scientific approach, you call them non-corporeal non beings, is, is another word. That there's lots of terminology for these so-called uh, entities. So the next attack, I guess I'm approaching spring of 1991, it kept telling me how worthless and pathetic humanity and I are. So it wasn't just attacking me, now it's attacking all of humanity. It's making very clear. And it kept saying that we're insignificant lumps of flesh destined to rotting, being eaten by bacteria and worms. And I would counter argue with them. Um, I would say that we were created by the divine hand. We didn't decide the composition of our flesh, blood, and bones. It was granted or forced upon us. So I've said in defense of this prosecuting attack, I said, how can you condemn our form, the shape of our human bodies, its makeup, when we had no say or control over how it was created. I said, take your arguments to God, not to me, but that's where you'll find the answer. And it was interesting because this prosecuting attack, it backed off right away. That only lasted about a week and a half or so. It's almost like it saw that my stance was pretty strong there and it didn't have a case. So it backed off. It reminds me of a predator when it's trying to test the prey to see where can it get in at? Where's the weak spot? Oh, definitely. And as Jerry mentioned, a lot of schizophrenic patients have trauma in their life, either psychological, physical, sexual abuse, that sort of thing. And I think these, these parasites, they see fractures in one's psyche and they go for it. They try and work their way into it. So I went through a whole bunch of different torments, or I don't know if you'd call them initiations, tortures, various trials. But I, I reached a point where I was so exhausted from all that I've been dealing with over the, the, this past year or so and the trauma that I, I was kind of facing back in time and dealing with the diagnosis of being having affective schizophrenic disorder having been counseling having to deal, deal with the, the drugs that i was taking as a part of prescription to tranquilize my so-called schizophrenic symptoms and these thoughts definitely make you feel worthless they want you to oftentimes they want me to kill myself and they would get very dramatic in how to do it i remember one thought or entity kept saying to climb up a high tension electrical tower and jump off from the high voltage of wires and just let your body hang there. That, that would go on for quite a bit. Like it was very dramatic. I think it approached the one to take. I did reach a point where I was actually getting the pipes out to 
kill myself with carbon monoxide poisoning in my garage. And I stopped, I mean, we had the duct tape out. I stopped partway through the process because there's a little compassion left in me because I had some nieces and I realized their uncle killed himself. What would that do to them? It would give them a permission slip to commit suicide too if they face dark times in their lives. That was a positive emotion, that was compassion that came up and stopped me from doing that. But it also, when I understand these entities, they don't like any type of positive emotion such as love, forgiveness, gratitude, compassion. It just, it repels them. So I reached a point, I'm approaching fall of 1991. I am unemployed, uh, going into financial debt. No sense of a future. I'm at rock bottom. I never thought I'd be able to climb out of, climb out of my situation. And I started to face these thoughts telling me that God doesn't exist. Give it up. There's no such thing as God. You're just a bunch of worthless, random creations of molecules. There's no meaning beyond your material existence. All those religions and scriptures out there, it's all a bunch of BS. It, it means nothing. And I was starting to believe them a little bit too. That's kind of what was keeping me going in life, the idea of a faith or in something greater than just our material bodies and, and, and our physical form. I was getting beaten and beaten down by all these attacks over, over the year. And finally, I started to pray to, I drew upon my faith. I started to pray to the highest essence of God, whatever he or she may be, to give me a sign. I said, I don't know if this is just madness and mental illness in my head. I don't know if this is some profound spiritual battle that I'm undergoing. I don't know if this is legitimate, what, what was occurring in my mind or, or not. And I said, but give me a sign. If you want me to continue existing in this world, you got to show me that you're there. I didn't care what the sign was. The sign could have been anything. If a priest showed up at my door and rang the doorbell the next day, I would have accepted that. If a Bible arrived by UPS by mistake in the mail addressed my address, I would have accepted that. But I, I need something definitive to prove to me that God still existed. And that was, this wasn't just some sort of mental illness going on in my head. So I prayed so intense for about two weeks, and then something very profound occurred. I was about two weeks of the most intense praying. I had a visual hallucination, or you could say a vision. I woke up one night about two or three o'clock in the morning with the sensation that there was a presence in the room. And I'd like to share a PowerPoint presentation that I put together that shows exactly what I saw. So this will give you view of what a so-called schizophrenic sees sometimes. And I use, I put schizophrenic in air quotes because it's a misnomer. Can you see my PowerPoint presentation okay? Yes. Okay. So I was in the room that I grew up in at this point in time. I was probably in my mid-20s, maybe 25 or 26, with the closet to the right and a shelf projection to the left there. That's kind of like what the room looked like. And I mentioned I've been praying for God to give me a sign that you exist, that what I'm going through is not just some sort of random mental illness, that there's something more profound going on here. I woke up about two or three o'clock in the morning with a feeling that there was a presence in the room. I'm lying in my bed, I'm looking around, I didn't see anything, just lying there. Look up at the ceiling, and you see the square ceiling fixture light there now? Okay, so I see the ceiling light, Nothing's in the room, I'm looking around, and I just, something told me, there was just a sensation, something's in the room here with me. And then all of a sudden, I start to see this kind of blackish, silverish, grayish smoke or fog start coming into the room, entering the room to the left of the light fixture. And at first, I thought it was electrical fire, that the wires were somehow were short circuiting and something was smoldering. But I realized, this isn't occurring where the wires are going into the light. And this is not moving like smoke. Smoke tends to come into a room and go rise up to the ceiling. This is coming into the room and going down. And more and more of the smoke or fog is coming into the room. And then it dawned on me, this is an electrical fire. This is a visual hallucination. And I'm thinking to myself, oh great. 
a year, about a year ago, I'm diagnosed with affective schizophrenic disorder. I've been having negative, a lot of negative thoughts, hearing negative voices or entities. Now I'm having a visual hallucination. This can't get any worse. But I was aware that I was having a hallucination when this was occurring. And part of me was kind of terrified. Okay, let's see where this goes. The other part of me, the scientist me, wanted to see where it goes. Like, it was curious. I was curious. The, these, our psychological textbooks talk about this sort of stuff. But what does it actually appear when a person encounters a visual hallucination? So more and more the smoke or, or S is coming into the room. I don't know if it had sentient itself, but it did not move like smoke. It moved like a fog. And I'm lying on my back, on my bed, looking up. And I start to see this dark portal open up in the middle of this cloud that is floating in my room. And the portal is getting larger and larger. And I'm looking into it. It's very dark. And believe me, part of me wants to run out of the room and get away from this. The other part of me is, is curious, wants to see where this goes. I was a little bit fixated on, on what was occurring here. So the portal is getting larger and larger and larger. And then I realized that a lot of this cloud or fog-like essence is entering from inside the circumference of this portal. It was kind of long and oblong. I'm looking into it, I don't see anything. More and more, this cloud is getting bigger, the portal is getting bigger. Then whoosh. I see these two serpentine tails or bodies move within the portal itself. It moves from top to bottom. I'm like, whoa. Okay, I'm having a hallucination versus of a cloud. Now it's snake like movements. And it was kind of like slithering the way it was moving. I'm thinking to myself, okay, I'm a little scared at this point. I'm thinking, well, whatever this is, it's on the other side of this portal. And then this is a break in reality seeing that this occur in my room. And I'm watching it move within the portal itself. And then more and more of the fog fills the room. And it reached a point where the portal was slightly obscured by the cloud of the fog that had formed. I couldn't really see it, but I knew the portal was still there. And I'm just watching. And then I start to see the serpentine movements within the cloud of portal itself. And I'm thinking, oh great, this thing's in my room, whatever it is. And at this point, I'm not, I wasn't so sure it was a visual hallucination. This could have actually materialized in my room. No way to prove or disprove otherwise, since I was the only one in the room at the time. And I'm seeing these snake like movements within the cloud. More and more of it. And I'm expecting this thing to come out, you know, have a snake like head on it. I figured it was some sort of serpentine entity. And I'm thinking, okay, this is mental illness I'm dealing with. Do I have a subconscious fear of snakes? And this is how it's portraying itself in a fearful projection. But I grew up near the woods. I handled snakes often as a kid. My college roommate had a pet bone constrictor that I used to handle with no problem. So I knew it wasn't a subconscious fear of snakes or anything like that. And then all of a sudden, I couldn't see anything. It was, the snake-like movements were obscured. The portals obscured. The clouds became bigger, more solid. It was kind of silverish, grayish, darkish is a good way of describing it. But it moved almost the way, if you ever drop food coloring in water, it moved the way food coloring moved through water, like, like a fluid type of motion. And then all of a sudden, this creature pops out of the cloud. It's got a serpentine body and a mammalian face on it. Now, from the side, it was kind of lion dog-like. And I remember I could see the details so clearly. I could see stubble on it. I could see whiskers, teeth. And it looked like it had a seam down its center, like it was two separate spines or two separate sets of vertebrae coming off its mammalian head or face. But I remember the sides were black scale-like, and the underbody was like a darkish gray underbelly. But I remember the underbelly was lighter than the sides of it. And at first I started laughing to myself. I'm thinking, okay, here it is. I'm having a visual hallucination. I expect to see some sort of snake come out of this cloud. This thing comes out with a lion dog like face on it. I'm like, what is my mind doing? What type of tricks is my mind playing on me? I expect to see like a, now a duck come out on like a frog's body or something different like that. But this thing, it comes all the way into the room. Whoops. Well, actually, I'll explain this. So I started to do some religious investigation because I was, I wanted to understand what I went through back in 1991. 
So I kind of did my own spiritual journey by reading a lot of books, doing some spiritual investigation of various religions and scriptures. And it was in the process of writing my own book. And I come across this image online. Now keep in mind, back in 1999, when I had this hallucination, there was no internet back then. I wasn't into the occult. I was just reading the standard uh, King James version of the New Testament, the Old Testament. I wasn't aware of any other occult books. I didn't know what it was. Came across this image within the last three years or so. This is on an amulet from about the oh, first, second, or third century. And it's referred to as Chnubis, which is an Egyptian, referred to as Egyptian god. And I came across this one below within the last couple of months. Again, referring to Chnubis, an Egyptian Gnostic or solar god, and this amulet from the third or fourth century. And if you look at how close or similar they look, they both have that seam down the side, like it looks like two separate spines or vertebrae. And you can even see in the gold amulet down there's a split down the spine, and it kind of has a lion like or dog like face from the side, it's kind of mammalian like. Now, this reference to Chnubis is also what the various Gnostic sects refer to as Abraxas, Yaldabel, Samuel. Uh, it goes by many different names. I don't, know, no, I don't know if all those names are accurate or not, but it has this particular being or creature has, or entity, has different references in the various different religious scriptures. It's also referred to as the Demiurge, or the Demiurge, depending how you want to pronounce it. It, the Rex Mundi, uh, Wetico, there's all different ways of referring to what this creature entity was. When this came out of the cloud back in 1991, when I saw it, I had no idea what it was. I didn't come across these images, as I said, for the last three years or so. So then this snake like entity comes fully into the room, and I saw it face on. It looked like a disheveled lion like a cat had been in a few cat bites. I remember there's some scratches on it. It looked like his left eye was scratched out completely or at least or a little bit or his blind in his left eye. And it didn't look that menacing at this point in time. I, it, I was more just kind of curious, well, what is this thing? You know, I figured if I was having a visual hallucination, it would just float around the room a little bit and go back into the cloud and, and go away and that would be the end of it. But I'm Curious and a little frightened at the same time because this, this is not normal reality, but I want to see where this goes. And I'm looking at it, and all of a sudden the face changes right before my eyes as it's coming at me. It changes in the most horrible possible thing you can think of. It was it looked like an old man or an old hag of decay. It was very grayish, prune-like. It was wrinkled and prune-like. It had it was ghoulish looking hobgoblin-like, and it came down towards me, almost like it was going to devour me, or attack me, or swallow me. And every cell in my body saw extreme terror and fright at this point in time, because this is not normal. I didn't know what was going to happen. I really thought this was the end of my existence, because part of me felt these things were really were in my room, that they material, actually materialized in the physical world within my room. And I thought I was going to die from whatever this thing was that was coming at me. And I remember I had a thought that I knew fighting it would have been pointless. This is much greater and more powerful than I. I knew I wasn't going to win if I tried to attack or fight it. So I had a thought. I decided to lower my ego. I didn't fight it. And I just projected love onto it. I don't know if that was my thought specifically or if that was influenced from a higher source telling me to do that. But anyhow, I decided just to lower my ego and project love onto it. That was the only so-called weapon that I, had, I felt like I had against it. And as I did it, it pulverized, disappeared, or vaporized. I remember it just was gone. And imagine you're lying there, and this lion-like, dog-like face is coming at you, changing into something so horrible, and it's coming at you. I'm thinking that was the, I was going to die. That was the end of my existence. And upon projecting love onto it, it disappeared, it vaporized. And I remember lying there in bed saying, oh my gosh, I'm still here. I think I'm still alive. The cloud is still there. The portal is still there. I knew I was in my room because I could still see the square feeling like ceiling like fixture above my head. So that was my point of reference, my dad on, to know that I was still in my room. 
Next thing I know, there's a new entity hovering overhead. It had like a white ivory porcelain mask like face to it. There was fluttering going on, like golden wings or wisps in, in the foreground. And I remember there's stuff in the background too. It kind of probably looked like golden wisps or strands that were like snapping or, or breaking or releasing, but there was like waves of energy I remember seeing, golden like wisps, and they appeared as wings. At least that's how my mind was interpreting them. There could have been two, three pairs of wings. It could have been four pairs of wings. And behind this entity, it seemed like reality was changing or fluttering, almost like if you're looking at a mirage over hot pavement, you see how the light kind of bends it. It kind of looked like that was going on behind it. Now, I was aware of this entity before it was aware of me, because I'm looking at waiting to see what it was going to do. It's almost like it wasn't aware that I was there. And we're just sitting there staring at each other. Or me, I'm sitting there looking at it. And then all of a sudden, it becomes aware of me, almost like it opened its eyes. Now, I drew this as a white porcelain like mask face, but it was sheer beauty. It had dark, pupilless eyes. I don't think its eyes were completely dark like this. That's the way I drew them. I just remember that they were dark eyes. And I'm not an artist, so I can't capture the beauty of what this face looked like. But I remember as I'm looking at it, I'm saying to myself, I shouldn't be looking at this. I'm a mere mortal. This is not of this reality. Part of me wanted to turn away just because I didn't think I was worthy to deserve to look at this. It was pure beauty. Now, it was androgynous looking. But I felt it was of a feminine nature as I'm looking at it and we're staring at each other. So we must have been looking at each other for, oh, 10 to 45 seconds or so, but it felt like an eternity. I don't know what it was doing. I don't know if it was judging me. I don't know if it was something that had been contained in prison or had been confined and now suddenly released from like a jail or a prison or being held captive and it was trying to figure out its orientation where it was. But I'm just staring at this and I'm thinking to myself, okay, that previous entity came in with a lion-like face, turned into something very horrible and came at me. This entity now looks very beautiful. What's it gonna do? Is it gonna change into something horrible and come at me? So I didn't know what was gonna happen next. I was really in a state of disbelief. And then all of a sudden, the fluttering is going on back and forth. We're just staring at each other. The cloud is starting to dissipate, but the portal is still there. I'm watching the fluttering, waiting to see what's going to happen. And then all of a sudden, the face smiles at me. And I remember, I could even, as it smiled at me, I could even see dimples forming in it. It was the most beautiful smile of grace I ever saw. And with that smile, I all of a sudden felt this huge wave of love come from it onto me. Uh, it was sending, it was putting me in a state of ecstasy bliss, extreme joy. And keep in mind, I've been dealing with these negative attacks for over a year. I hadn't felt these sensations or feelings for a long, long, long time. It was the most intense, amplified feelings of love, joy, bliss, ecstasy. And I, I'd say erotic too, and not in the physical sense, but in the idea that I was like merging this being, like we were somehow connected. So as the smile beautiful smile of grace comes at me, I'm starting to have an out-of-body experience. I felt like I was rising out of my body and I'm starting to merge with this beautiful white face mask porcelain entity. The entity is starting to move, going into that portal from which the other entity came out of. It's going upwards. I'm rising out of my body towards it. And it's like we're both merging together. And, and I'm in a extreme state of ecstasy, bliss. It was almost like it told me everything's going to be fine. And we're merging together. And just as I'm about to 100% merge with this, together with this entity, almost like becoming one being, and pass through this portal at the same time, simultaneously, I fell back to sleep. Or I was put back to sleep. But I remember I went out just like that, just as, as I was crossing through the portal. So everything went gray and dark as I'm just passing from this reality into this other reality. 
merging with this beautiful white face mask entity of being. And then I fell back asleep and everything went gray or dark, or I was put back to sleep. Now, I woke up the next morning about six or seven o'clock. I was in a state of spiritual shock and really just shock. It's like, what just happened? I didn't know what to do with this. I was dumbfounded for a couple of weeks after this. I didn't trust myself. I figured, okay, I'm going to start having other visual hallucinations now because I've been diagnosed with affective schizophrenic disorder. I didn't trust my mind. I'm thinking more hallucinations are going to occur. But that is the only visual hallucination I've had in my life. So time went on, you know, uh, weeks passed by, months, years. I didn't tell my counselor about any of this stuff. I wasn't, I didn't want to tell her that I had a visual hallucination for two reasons. One, I didn't want her telling me it was just a hallucination because this was the only thing holding me together. And two, I knew if I told her I was going to be putting on harder drugs that, oh, she's starting to visual hallucinate. He's probably going to be, you need to put on harder drugs or sedate him even more. I wanted to get on with my life. I didn't want to keep dealing with this effective schizophrenic diagnosis. But here it was. I had these strong voices or thoughts, auditory hallucinations, telling me that God doesn't exist. Give it up. And then I have this profound vision or visual hallucination. That visual hallucination negated everything that those voices were telling me. So here I'm applying logic. Okay, the logic is something's telling me that God doesn't exist. Then I have something like this experience that negates whatever was telling me that God doesn't exist. Because that was just it was such a profound just experience. Now there's so many different ways to interpret this stuff. I've been studying, reading up on this stuff for years and years. I mean I I didn't know the words Abraxas or Demiurge or Yaldabaoth for the last few years. So I didn't know what this entity was when it came into my room with the serpentine body and things like tail. The white porcelain mask face entity that just projected sheer beauty or love onto me. It could have been what they referred to as a, a, a seraph. It could have been like a, a sephiro, sephiro, like what's displayed on some of the Kabbalistic tree of life. It could have been what the Gnostics referred to as Sophia, uh, an emanation of God. Could have been Barbalo, going back even farther. I don't know if it was all one entity that I was dealing with and it was two sides of the coin. Like my projection of love had changed that previous snake-like serpentine entity into this beautiful entity. I don't know if there are two separate entities where the beautiful white horse mask entity could be my guardian angel, my higher self, uh, something that the previous entity was, was trying to suppress or, or capture. There are so many different ways to interpret this stuff, and I have to keep an open mind when I approach it. You know, some people have referred to both entities being evil because they're not this real, but I got to tell you, that second entity, that saved me because it told me that there's much more to our material existence than just the physical self, that there is something to our soul and our spirituality. So after having this experience, it's like, you know, who do you want to tell? Do I run out and tell a rabbi? Do I tell a priest? Do I tell my counselor? Um, I've kept this bottled up to myself for a good 20 to 30 years. But it, it, it gave me hope. It, it gave me a foundation to start rebuilding myself as a human being. It, it got my identity back. It was kind of like, aha, you voices. You're telling me that God doesn't exist. You're putting all these negative thoughts on me. And all of a sudden, I have this experience. So I don't know if that snake-like entity with the lion-like face was the head parasitic entity itself, the head archon that they refer to as the Demiurge, Yaldabaoth or Abraxas. I don't know if there's a whole species of these things within the world of thought and consciousness, these non-corporeal beings that I guess tried to present themselves to us every once in a while. But this is the stuff that the prophets of, prophets of history have written about within the various texts, scriptures, and it could be Christian scriptures, Judaic scriptures, Hinduistic scriptures, Islamic scriptures, Buddhist scriptures, they, they talk about this stuff, but it, it, they interpret it entirely different. So like I said, I don't know specifically what, what went on, what's going on. Um, all that I can say is there is something going on in a world beyond our visual capability. There is something greater than our material self. We do seem to have a soul or a greater, higher essence. 
And upon having that visual hallucination, that was the turning point. Because I would say I kind of crossed over from being a mad person, thinking I'm this, this is lunatic, to becoming a mystic and being able to handle it. So the voices started to subside. They were probably still crying, but they started to subside at that point because it's like they lost their grip on me. They gave themselves away by revealing themselves in that visual hallucination. And once they did that, it was like, you are external of me. Aha. Uh -huh. And that's the thing, that they don't want you to maintain your identity. They want to distort your reality. They want to generate those negative emotions. And I started working on myself a lot more so to create more positive emotions. And over time, they, they definitely faded away. I know Jerry's approach that those hardcore psychiatric drugs that are prescribed will not cure the patient. He's absolutely correct. They tranquilize their sedatives and they destroy the gray matter of our brain over long term use. I truly view, view it as a spiritual battle, and I won through logic and love. That, that, that was the founding, that was my weapon, was sending love onto these entities when they came in. It's common. Those who are schizophrenics who can do that report that the voices react to it like being hit with a blowtorch. Now, here's where logic goes out the window. Why did I see something come out of a cloud that the Gnostic text talked about almost 2,000 years ago? or an Egyptian solar entity deity from four or 5,000 years ago. I never had, I've never seen that face before. I didn't know what it was in front of the cloud. This is just my more recent research last three years where I started discovering this stuff. Why did I see something that apparently had been already documented in history? That's where you have to apply logic to say, there's something more going on here than just random hallucinations. I was looking up the descriptions and the drawings of the different types of angels that are within the bible and there's what the cherubim which has the different faces it has the face of the ox the lion the eagle and man yep you have the multiple faces yes and then there's also i think it's in the book of enoch where enoch is describing the angel as almost like a machine with all of those wings okay and yep. the circles within the circles uh, and when I saw that second picture, it reminded me of that description as well. Now, I know the circles in the circles often have multiple eyeballs on it, too. Yes. So I've discovered. That was just fantastic, by the way. I was totally reliving that with you as you were doing it. You're transporting somebody through that process that maybe they don't have that gift or talent within them. I loved it. And what I got from that was... I just was seeing over and over again, all those things that I've read about and that I've seen people draw or, you know, there's been excellent famous paintings of these descriptions from the Bible that anyone can do a quick internet search and you'll see the things that I'm talking about. But it, it was really fascinating, the whole progression of it and thinking of the books and the material that I used in the paper, what you visually were showing look like a time storm. I don't know if you're familiar with the book Time Storms by Jenny Randalls, but I'm I will not. I will send you a link for that. A I'll lot of down. people have experienced that manifestation, not within the state that you were within, but while they were driving, while they were walking. It was something that multiple people have experienced at the same time. So it's not just one person seeing it and experiencing and feeling it and feeling the effects that come from it, you would really enjoy time storms. And so I do have some questions that would come directly from what I read within that book. And I've actually asked Jerry about this as well. So he can chime in too. If you could think back, whenever you were seeing that cloud come through, did the temperature in the room change at all? Do you remember any temperature changes, hot or cold? I would, oh boy, I, I remember I, I felt, there was a sensation that whatever was in the room that I was frightened of it. I remember that. Like it was, remember I said I felt there was a presence in the room, but I felt like it was a negative presence when okay. it first occurred. But 
So I, no, no temperature I, changes or anything like that. that. I recall. I okay. Don't recall that. I, I, I don't want to. I don't want to make up things in my head. Yeah. If I hundred percent recall it, I'll be honest with you. If I don't, I'll say okay. yeah, I don't recall. Yeah, because like with time storms, it's very distinct. It's either burning hot where it leaves a sunburn on their skin. Some people have gotten so hot where they passed out. Or, you know, to the other extreme where the atmosphere goes from comfortable to cold it would have been something that you would have definitely would have been yeah, very I don't distinct. Just, I don't distinctly remember. I just okay. Distinctly. And then was there any auditory information that came through? Did you hear crackling? A lot of people within time storms, it's almost as if it's an electrical type of storm that they're being involved in. Their skin will get goosebumps. It'll feel as if the electricity is connecting with their skin and they'll hear crackling and buzzing sounds. You, you know, I've, been that, I've been asked that question before. It was like hearing anything. But, you know, I think I was so focused on the visual aspect of it that I wasn't paying attention to the That was like all consuming aspect. for you. No, that's fine. Yeah. That's fine. Just for my own research purposes, I wanted to ask those questions because I, mean, I, I know that Jerry that, has that, had some where all of that has been experienced. So. Right. Yeah. I will say this much. I think when that face changed from just the lion like to the horrible cob goblin thing, I probably went to instantaneous goosebumps all over my body at that point in time because yeah. I was, my whole body felt like it was just in a state of horror and fright for mm -hmm. a split second when it changed. And I, and by protecting love on it, I changed that, that situation. But I just remember, yeah, I felt like it was just all over, horror, terror all over my body when that, when that face had changed. Do you think it happened within a split second or are we talking about minutes? Or are we talking about a half an hour, an hour? Cause I know whenever you're in those types of situations, time almost feels like it stopped. Did you yeah. have sense of time slowing down, speeding up or stopping altogether? Yeah. I mean, when I looked at that, when I was in the porcelain white mask face, I was staring at each other. It felt like an eternity. But I mean, I was, okay. it wasn't, it was definitely longer than seconds when all this occurred. I think you start to finish. If I had to put a number on it, I'd say the whole ordeal might have been maybe five minutes, give or take, plus yeah. minus two. The other thing that people report from time storms is that they get this sense of timelessness and everything around them almost seems to pause or stop or freeze. I was curious if that happened with you as well. Yeah, I mean, time, um, I definitely felt time was distorted. Uh -huh. It was definitely a, a merger of two different realities, our material world and something from a higher sphere, whatever you want to call it. But yeah, I woke up at six or seven in the morning. And of course, when uh -huh. I do the PowerPoint presentation, okay, how long did that take? That takes about, what, five, 10 minutes to describe everything. So that's why yeah. I put the number on maybe five, five minutes or so. You said something earlier that maybe it was an initiation. I also talk about that in the paper. I was intrigued when you brought that up. Do you feel as if because you, you went on this journey, it stuck with you. It's now what, 20 years later, and you're still trying to pull on that thread and you're becoming wiser. You're becoming more educated. It's growing with you. And it seems as if this is evolving and growing with you because you are still searching for answers. Do you feel looking back reflecting back on it now that you've had all this time to process it, do you feel as if it was some type of initiation through um, a dark archetypal force of nature? Yeah, I mean, it actually it occurred about 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. uh, it was 1990, 1991. That's I a long was... time for something to be working with you, um, working with you, on you, in you, and through you to get to I, the point where, you know. It was such a profound experience that you never, I would never, will never forget it. Let's yeah. put it that way. And it's always mm -hmm. kind of been a part of me. Well, I think what's happened is that, you know, the internet wasn't around back in these days. And I always yeah. got the internet to so be able to ascertain more information and come across. There's books out now that read about this stuff. And it's, yeah, see, but back be... then we had to go to the library <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to yeah. actually look and, things up and you and, had to rely on the librarian to point you in the right direction. And people don't realize how easy it is now to get information. And when something like this happens, I'm so glad you brought that up. When something like this happens to you back in the day, in our time, I could see how it would have been difficult to even do the research on it. Nowadays, you can just do a quick internet search, describe the entity or the thing that you saw and boom, 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 you get all these images. You get people that are really good at sketching and you'll find an actual sketch and then that'll lead you down the path. But back in the nineties, we didn't have stuff like that. You probably would have seen something on a comic book or something along those yeah, you lines. You walk in the library and say, excuse me, I like a book that talks about snake-like entities with lion-like faces on it. 
Yeah. The library would look at you like, what? Yeah, they're like, the comic book, the sci-fi section is over there. Have fun. <laughs> yep. So go back to initiation, I guess, because I have to keep an open mind because there's multiple ways of interpreting the experience that I encountered, but it's definitely very similar to what some of the Gnostics went through. I mean, they talk about the stuff, the non Hamadi library that was, that was discovered. I mean, there's even talk about this entity called Sophia being trapped in the cloud and Yaldabaoth dwelling in a cloud. I mean, they even, they even talked about this stuff. And I wasn't aware of any of this stuff back in 1991 when I had this occurrence. So it's taking a while to process it. The other thing too is the human mind can get overloaded with divine experiences. I think our ape-like brain over circuits sometimes or overloads when we're having these, these divine encounters. Because, okay, if I had seen this, had that visual hallucination of the serpentine entity of the lion-like face, and if six months later I went and saw it in a book or something like that, being in my mid-20s, that could have overwhelmed me, you know, to the point of emotionally high charge how would my mind or emotion, my mind been able to handle that being now more middle-aged it's like i can read that stuff i don't quite feel the emotional intensity with it sure there's synchronicities that are occurring and everything else but i've learned to accept them that yeah okay another synchronicity that, that, that that's cool i don't get overwhelmed by them i don't have they don't drive me mad I, I yeah whereas back mm -hmm. then if i started counting all this stuff who knows where I could have gone down? Yeah, I you think. might have actually relapsed and gone in reverse. At that young age, might have obsessed the wrong way about it versus when we're in our 40s, 50s, we can look at it from a more mature perspective and you obsess in a different way, you know, about finding the answers to something. I think a healthy um, approach to it. I, I think, I mean, the, the, the Kabbalah tree of life we talked about, the one pillar being 100% spiritual, the other pillar on the other side being 100% material. And the idea is to kind of be in balance between the both. Mm -hmm. Because, hey, we still have to eat, work, pay our taxes, yes. you know, pay, pay our bills. And you get so obsessed with the spiritual aspect that you kind of lose grip with the physical reality. Mm -hmm. And you've got to keep yourself kind of balanced and well-grounded to address these things. You're walking within two worlds as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, after this happens to you, you are separated from the majority of society at that point. And that's where I see the initiation process occurring, where you're um, being pulled out from the consensual reality that we all agree upon. The grass is green, the sky is blue. And now you're adding this other layer to it that you have to push that other aspect of reality to the side so that you can live within this world for a little bit and then you can kind of bring that aspect back and you have to mix it together to come out with this product that is this individual that can straddle reality but at the same time still live within the consensual reality that we all have to live in because like you said we have to have shelter transportation food money all of these things and that other aspect of reality doesn't require those things. Not only do you have to live within the material, like you said, you have to learn how to adapt to this other aspect that's reaching in through to you. And it works in you, on you, and through you. And you have to go through this adaptive type of process in order to get to the point where you're sitting here across from us, you're presenting something very nebulous and paranormal and out there, as most people would say, that are still within that bubble that the majority of the population is in, you have to be able to articulate it and talk about it in a mature manner so that you can educate people on this process. I'm hoping that with this channel, people that may come across this presentation that you gave, they might have just had something very similar and they don't know where to go. They don't even know where to start because they just popped out of that bubble that everybody mm -hmm. else is in and they find themselves alone. And they're like, what do I do? Because I still have to deal with all of these people over here, yet now I'm over here. And then they find others that are over here. And then those others start to form a bubble. And that's where this conversation comes into play where, okay, we find like-minded individuals, we are grounded, we're mature, 
And now we're trying to figure out how the hell did we get here? What the hell does all of this mean? And how do we then deal with not only this new aspect of the reality that we find ourselves in, but then how do we reincorporate ourselves back into dealing with these other people so that we don't scare them? <laughs> you know, like people you're going to be around are not going to be able to process what you just talked about. And you have to be able to live within that world as well. And I'm not being condescending when I say that. That's reality. And especially and, um, in engineering. Oh, yeah, exactly. And so this is and what I love. Anon about, is an engineer. Yeah, this is what I love about your background, because I like when science and spirituality meet, because that's where you can have a very mature, grounded conversation. And when somebody like you has an experience like that, you can articulate it and graphically show it. And then also you have the ability to logically drill down into it as well. So I'm just so grateful that you are sharing your story and that you've had the time to process it, work through it, and really think about how it should be presented to others so that it can be more of an educational type of conversation instead of something that's salacious and, and you're just trying to get attention and focus in on the actual thing that came through. It's not about the thing that came through. It's about how it worked on you and it was meaningful and the way in which you processed it was manageable. I think those two things are what needs to come across when you have an experience like this and not just focus on the entity, but focus on the individual and how they were able to process it. Because in the end, that's what somebody needs to work and figure out for themselves when something like this happens. They need examples of this is what I did. This is what I saw. You might not see the same thing. You're going to see something totally different, but it's an example of how to process this type of experience with reality. I'm sorry, I went off on a tangent. <laughs> oh, no, it's fine. And I think what it is, it's being emotionally, having a proper emotional reaction to you know, think, think of our birthdays when we were like five or six years old. You know, our birthdays were coming up. We got so excited about it. You know, we, we, we shake with, with, with excitement. Your 40s and 50s, another birthday coming around. You don't quite react the same way when you're younger, your, your teens, your 20s, you have these experiences. The, the emotions take over. It's tough mm -hmm. to ground yourself back to reality. And again, when I had all this stuff, I, I couldn't tell or talk to anybody about this stuff. It wasn't until oh, yeah. the last few years that I've been able to come out with it. So I still had to you know, get a job and yeah. Work, work the daily grind, but not being able to tell anybody what I went through. And I, the joke is, yeah, I, one doesn't put down their job application, saw a demon come out of a cloud. Yeah. Kill uh, qualifications. It doesn't go yeah. over well. I ran so, into the same thing. I was seeing and experiencing all these things with the voices, and I couldn't tell a soul about yeah. it. You have to hide it for all of these years. Yeah. And, and that really takes a toll on you as an individual, but yet you still have to perform. You still have to act normal within society. And I think you'll need to be commended for that, um, that you were able to still function and still relate to others. And yet you had this going on within yourselves. And I think that's where the initiation aspect comes in, because it really does take a strong personality to have that lingering in the back of your head you can't get answers. You're getting up, you're going to work, you're doing everything everyone normally does. You're going to the grocery store, yet it's always there. You're processing in the background continuously. Yes. Yeah, you're continuously processing. I remember sitting in staff meetings because I have a corporate background. And I remember just sitting there thinking, you know, uh, the things that were happening to me, like what happened with you outside of work. And yet here I am sitting in a staff meeting and I have to present numbers and I have to have these conversations with people. And I'm like, this is weird. <laughs> I mean, what is going on? You really do want to reach out and talk to somebody next to you. And I did try that. I tried that a couple of times and you either get that blank stare or they'll completely change the subject. I need to do a video on the different reactions that you'll get. I've started logging them. You'll get the blank stare. Sometimes people will get angry depending on the topic or the subject matter that you bring up, or they'll just change the subject and act as if you never even said what you said. That is the creepiest one. It's like this program triggers. Yeah. yeah.
Yeah, wow. it's this programming that triggers that they're not ready to hear it. And something within them or within reality will just completely shift their perspective. And they'll start talking about something else. And you have to be the adult and be like, okay, they weren't ready to hear this. So I'm just never going to bring it up again. And you make a right. mental note of who that happened with. And thank God there's technology now that we can reach out and talk to people. Because like you said, years and years ago, this wasn't a possibility. The three of us wouldn't be talking. We probably never would have found each other. So I think it's fascinating that you said this started, what, three years ago, where you found these pictures and you started connecting dots. Yeah, because I, yeah. I, I was writing a book based on what, from my religious experiences. I, I, wanted, I didn't understand the vocabulary. There was no vocabulary that I was aware of to associate with what I went through. For example, yeah. you mentioned initiation. That my, my out-of-body experience merger with that porcelain white-faced ent mass entity, you know, guardian angel, uh, Sophia, that can be referred to as what one calls a hero's gamut, you know, a, a sacred a sacred marriage, a sacred wedding, the merging with a higher entity. Now that's one interpretation. I don't have, I don't take on a definitive approach to any of the multiple interpretations out there. I try to incorporate them all into a common amalgam because we really don't know for certain how to approach exactly. it. Exactly. And I'm really glad that you said that because you have to remember that we're never going to get to the bottom of something in this reality. It's almost the way that it's designed is for us to, yeah, to just get close enough. And I, and I always say to friends and family, if they ask me about what is this metaphysics, like, give me a definition. And I'm like, metaphysics is like horseshoes and hand grenades. Getting close to an answer is good enough because you're <laughs> never going to get to the bottom of it. And you'll go mad if you think yeah. that you are, if you just approach it from the fact that I'm, I may never get to the bottom of this until I pop out of my body and I die. And even at that point, we don't know, we're not guaranteed. So w if you just come at it from that approach, then you can relax a little bit and say, okay, let's look at this uh, you know, more objectively and let's have conversations and let's look at all the data and say, okay, this sounds about right. That doesn't sound right. And it's going to change as you experience this and as you get older and you mature and you have different experiences and you talk with different people, you may look like I may look 10 years from now at the paper that I wrote and I might disagree with almost all of it. And you have to be mature or you'll enough. say, who was that person that wrote that paper? That yeah, like what an idiot. What was I thinking? I hope to God uh, that doesn't happen because that would be horrible, but uh, that has to be on the table. I've said that in other interviews, everything is on the table when it comes to this stuff until you can get to a point where you're close enough to rule it out, but it still kind of has to be on the edge of that table because you might want to bring whatever that is back into play at some point in time, but never think that you're so sure of something because the universe will smack your face. It'll treat you like a human pinata and it will smack It'll humble you in a second. Oh yeah. And and that's, that's another thing that you have to really fight with, with this stuff is like, you know, you might come to the conclusion that I really think I know what this is. And then a couple weeks later, something will happen. And it's like, I'm so glad I didn't put that in the paper. I'm so glad I didn't talk about that because it ended up being, I was wrong. I interpreted something incorrectly. And as you're talking about what you saw in those images, five years from now, you might look back on that and think, wow, I was incorrect in the way that I was perceiving that. And now I have more information and more experience. Now I get it. Now I know what it is at this point. And I'm glad that you still have that kind of inquisitive aspect to you that there, there may be something more. I'm not there yet type of thing. That's what I'm kind of getting from this conversation. Is that accurate? Oh, I'll take that as a compliment. I, I, okay. I, I, what <laughs> yeah, that, that's, you. Where, that's where I try and approach it from. And I'm really happy to see that uh, you were successful and working yourself through this experience because do you think that so let me go back i do have i have a question here how long did it take you it sounded like it took about four or five years for you to stabilize to the point where you were able to get a job again and uh, probably, probably less than that um okay i'd probably say within three years i was pretty much working again now i still there's still stuff going on in my head but i was able to i guess hide it more so it was easier okay. to keep it contained it was i was able to function a, a nor relatively well and i remember in my abnormal psychology class professor saying 
we all have these types of personality traits. It's yeah. just when they go above a certain threshold, you're no longer functioning well in life that they become a problem, what we call mental illness. I would say I still have a lot of stuff going on, but it's low level where I can at least, I can at least handle it. So, um, yeah, I was even working part time probably by late 1992. And okay. I think I was fully back into the full time job by 93 or 94. But it was a continuous process, though, to try and focus on more positive aspect, a positive outlook on life, to try and bring in those better positive emotions. I mean, forgiveness was a lot of what I had to work with to kind of forgive what went on in my family situation. I mean, I, mm-hmm. I grew up around drugs. There was death and everything else. And the fact that I didn't become a drug addict is a miracle in and of itself. I was around cocaine as a young child and uh, marijuana all over the place, pills. I was like seven, eight or nine. So I mean, there's, there's a lot going on. The fact that I, I had to fight to maintain a higher path, I guess, even as a child. And that created, I guess, trauma that I think, you know, <laughs> later on, suppressed trauma, I would say, because I didn't realize how badly it was really affecting me until I got out of college. I actually had time to think for myself. I wasn't trying to protect or save other people. I was actually trying to focus myself a little bit. Um, so definitely we all have negative thoughts. That's normal. But to try and approach life with more of a positive aspect outlook, I think, I think is key. I mean, bad stuff happens to the world. It happens to all of us. Mm-hmm. But we're not going to get through the bad stuff as easy if we don't have a more positive outlook in our approach on things. I, I struggle with this every day. I'm perfectly keeping up a, a positive front. I get cynical at times and that sort of thing. But uh, you start to focus on what's really important in, in life too sometimes. So what, what really matters, what doesn't matter. I mean, just the fact that we're alive here today, we're talking, we, we can afford the technology to talk to each other. Got to be grateful for that alone. That's something that, where we can express gratitude for, that we can afford to pay our electrical bills and, and everything. This was affecting you in your 20s. Did it also affect you into your 30s? Or do, would you have considered yourself healed when you um, were in I, your 30s? Or was it still lingering? Because I know, Jerry, you've talked about it's almost like a battle where it could come and go. Right? Yeah. And I'm still learning too. I ran into a client I was working with the other day who for the first time got furious at the voices, which I thought would feed them. She pushed them out because she realized what they were. She was resentful about them. She just blasted them like, you have no right to be here. I know what you are. You've destroyed my life. Get out. And they left, which amazed me. So I'm still learning. I know a lot about them. I know a lot about what to do about them. I've worked with hundreds of people. A number of them have fully recovered, but I'm still learning. I mean, Mm -hmm. I'm still hearing stories that, you know, show different aspects of these things that I Mm -hmm. never knew before. Wow. And so, so, so did it, did you relapse? You know, I guess I'll use that word. Did you have a relapse with the voices? Um, Any point like, uh, and, and so this is where I'm trying to go with this is I'm trying to figure out for you, do you know what was the trigger for you and if it did relapse could you pinpoint okay this triggers me this doesn't so i avoid that yeah i probably have had relapses but not to the extent of those initial experiences in in my well we all get hit by these things every every negative thought you have about yourself or other sherry sweeney says comes from them yes she talks about it's that constant battle of you know they'll come back in and then they'll leave for a while and then they'll come back and leave for a while. Did you experience that from the onset of they were there all the time? You uh, pretty much healed yourself. Did they try and come back in from different angles? You know, I would say after that visual hallucination, I was probably, I would say I was fully out of being in that schizophrenic spectrum by my late 20s. Okay. I, I was still trying to fathom or process the experience that I went through. And so I was, I kind, of, I kind of put it on hold in the background, I would say, where I'm doing religious investigation to try and figure out some of the stuff. And there's times where I think it comes back, but not, not in the heavy duty voices, more so like if I face extreme crisis again, that can kind of hit one heavy and bring one down. You can call them, you know, mini midlife crises. Can, can trigger that as well. But each having survived this stuff and been through it, you, you learn from it. You realize, okay, it's not the end of the world. I'll get through this. We're going to the next thing. You know, I did have an 
auditory hallucination in the summer of 1991 that was rather pronounced. And but instead of I, I took a mystical approach to it instead of the mad person approach to it. And that's the difference I think when you were talking about early on about how people process this stuff. If they let it emotionally overwhelm them where they become so obsessed on it they're not functioning in life, that's taking it kind of a madness approach to it. They approach it more like, oh, this is interesting. I, I'm curious about this. I want to learn more, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it in a healthy manner. That's more the mystical approach because you're, you're taking a stable path as opposed to kind of frenzied madness. But in, I was reading the Nag Hammadi Library, the English translation of it for the first time back in the summer of 1991. And I was just about to fall asleep. And then I heard, I had an auditory hallucination of a voice saying the words, Ha ha. It was, all, but it wasn't laughing. It was saying the words, ha ha. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if it was a feminine or masculine voice, could be a combination of both. But I remember it was so loud in my head, I jumped out of bed. I mean, it, mm -hmm. it startled me. I was a little shaken for a while. And so I took the dog out for a walk, came back about 20 minutes later, started reading more chapters of the Nag Hammadi Library. And all of a sudden, I came across this section that talks about how. Oh, Sophia laughs in her captivity, and I think Yaldabelt laughed. I mean, it was just the word laughter was coming in there. And that was four pages ahead prior to when I had that auditory hallucination. And I said to myself, huh, another synchronicity. I didn't let it drive me mad, but I wrote down the sections that I encountered and everything else. But to have an auditory hallucination of somebody saying, ha ha, and then to read about these from the ancient Gnostic scriptures about their gods or deities having laughter over their predicament and situation. It was kind of, it was an odd synchronicity, I'll say that much. Mm -hmm. When I hear a story like that, I, I think of it's a test. It's some aspect of yourself uh, that's going to do this in the sequence that you received it to see, okay, which way is he going to go? Is he going to, like you said, is he going to obsess about that? and not put the two and two together, or is he gonna take that mystical approach? And it's like, when you did, it was like, oh, okay, good. Now we can continue down this path. If I was to look at it from an initiation standpoint and, ass and assess it in that way, that's how I would look at it is either, you know, maybe your ancestors or this other future you is stretching their hand back in time to say, how can we test and on to see did he, is he starting to learn from this or does he need a little bit more initiation work before he can get on that path? There's usually a turning point in somebody's uh, story that I can look at and say, that was probably a point where you deviated and you fully went on into that type of initiation. And if you had maybe interpreted it a different way, you would have eventually gotten to the point where we're at now, but it, you would have gone a different way to get to it. So oh, to had, me, he, had he I, not split himself off from the voices. Yes. He, he, oh yeah. He would have, he well, that was like, a, that was like the big, that was know, the biggie. Yeah. That was the big one. This was like the little test. We're going to send the voice in and we're going to see how do you respond to this and how do you interpret it? And the question is, okay, was that a negative entity testing me? Yeah. Or was, or was it a positive entity saying, hey, I'm still here. I'm still with you. You're like your guardian angel. Just, you know, the trickster, right. the trickster as they call it. Yeah. See, they, I they would look at archetype. that as positive because it was, uh, that's just my opinion with everything that I've read and I've experienced myself. I would look at that as positive because it was followed up by information that you could corroborate it with. It wasn't just like, ha ha, and it left you hanging. And then it was ha ha where you're in the shower and then ha ha where you're here. And it started bombarding you. It was like, ha ha. And then you had the information once and done and the information upon the information. Yes. coming. Yep. So it was like, we're going to test you. How do you respond to this? You pass the test. And then did you have anything beyond that point that was something similar, maybe in the same flavor of it, but not exactly that you could, I, I mean, I know I'm going back with you here and what? reflecting. So <laughs> I'm putting you on the spot in a sense, and I don't mean to do that. Oh, it's fine. But, it's totally fine. I'm happy to, happy to share these experiences because they'll hopefully they'll help others who are. Yeah. On, on yeah because I've talked with other people about some dark experiences and when you walk them through it you can either walk them through it let them tell their story and then go back or you can like interrupt them as you go so i wanted to hear your whole story and then go back and kind of pick it apart and i've done this with another woman 
And what's interesting is if you can start threading that pattern, you can see the initiation points that you went through. And then other people, they might not have that same sequence of auditory. And then I read something, but they might have something where somebody said something to them and then somebody else said something to them and then they read something. So it's going to come at you different ways, but the flavor of it and the process of it is going to, it's going to have that same tone to it in a sense. Did you have anything other else besides that auditory and then information happen? Any type of synchronicities that you can kind of, um, Oh, kind of, they, they almost look like breadcrumbs as you're going through your life. Oh, there's been lots of synchronicities throughout the decade, but you know, mm -hmm. uh, just spending more on just the word initiation, and then I'll get back to your, your question about that. I'll tell you what, another interesting synchronicity, so to speak. Um, so I say initiation because when I had an encounter with the serpentine ended line like face, and I chose to project love onto it instead of reading the state of fear, that could have been a test for all I know, or an initiation type of thing. And mm -hmm. again, multiple interpretations. I don't have definitive answers, but just give me different perspectives on things. So the yeah. presentation that I showed you, that's what I saw, interpreting and encountered, interpreting it all afterwards. That's the tough part and, and the real challenge. But that could be an initiation in and of itself. And as far as the synchronicity goes, here's an interesting one. So I came across, of course, the writings of Paul Young um, mm -hmm. within the last three years. I started reading some of his books. And I realized, oh, wow, he's, you know, he's, he talks about some of this stuff. He was in some of the Gnosticism. He even has wore a ring on his finger of a Braxis. And it was the lion face entity with the serpentine body. He has an original ring, I think, going back to ancient times. But Carl Jung, some of the photos, he's wearing that actual ring of a Braxis or, or the Demurge or Yaldabaoth, whatever name you want to call it. But what had happened is I uh, I heard about Carl Jung and I said, huh, this is an interesting guy. I should read up on him. I really didn't know much about him at the time. So I, I ordered my first book on Carl Jung in the morning. That evening, I happened to, I went to bed to sleep a little bit earlier. I happened to flip on the television and turn on Star Trek, one of the earlier versions. I think Star Trek, The Next Generation, just watching a rerun of it. And sure enough, that episode, they're talking about Carl Jung and, and, and talking about shadows and everything else. Now, and what are the, I you call it coincidence, you call it yeah. synchronicity. But here it is. I, I, I just heard of Carl Jung. I ordered my first book that day. And all of a sudden, on a television show, and they're happy to be talking about Paul Young and the shadows and everything else. You could have picked any channel. You could have turned on the radio instead. You could have done all these other things. You could have read a book instead. But yeah, I think that's fascinating and very helpful when you can go back and piece those things together. And when I have such strong stick news, I do write them down with a courage. It's my yeah. own records. Yeah, otherwise you'll but, forget. Yeah. 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 I, had, I had one like your ha-ha one. Um, yeah. You know, I, I, I was fed up with everything that was going on at the prison, at work, with, you know, with everything. So I took off on my motorcycle up the mountain on at sunset to watch the sunset, to just get away from everything and just peacefully sit there and watch the sunset. So as I'm, I'm sitting there on the bike watching the sun goes down, I, I heard a voice as clear as a bell said, go see Miss Canaan. And, and I'm like, what? You know, and I said, give me a minute. Just give me a minute. It said, no, go now. And I'm like, all right, all right. Okay. Now, Miss Canaan was like 85 years old. She was a Christian scientist. She probably would have been in bed and asleep two hours before I got there. So I rode the motorcycle across town, went to Miss Canaan's house, knocked at her on her door at like 830. She normally was asleep. She comes to the door and she goes, what are you doing here? And I said, I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> And I told her what happened. And we just sat there and we talked the rest of the Aww. evening. You know, um, I learned a lot from Christian science, but they don't believe in the devil. They don't believe in demons. They don't believe in anything like that. That's mm -hmm. bad. That's yeah. really bad. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely, I agree with you because, um, you know, Malachi Martin, the Jesuit priest that has written tons of books. He was on Art Bell. If you're not, are you familiar with him? And Art on? Bell? I, yeah, I, Malachi I'm not, Martin. No. Okay. Um, I, I've heard I'll the say, name, but I'm not, not familiar. Yeah. He wrote a lot of fiction. Actually, a lot of the information that he got out about the Catholic Church, he was able to do it through fiction, but he does have some nonfiction books as well. And I'll send you information on him. He talks about how if you ignore it, it's actually worse because it can disguise itself a lot yeah. easier. You know, yeah. you're, you know, you're not able to develop that armor. 
that you should have when you're dealing with evil. And it can put on a different mask because it knows that you think it's not real. So it can work on you in a different way. That's the same thing with these hallucinations. As long as psychiatry keeps pushing that they're hallucinations, they're not real. That's yeah. evil having full reign without interference. I think the best thing somebody who's doing this like a schizophrenic patient can do is ask them what the voices are saying. Because you're showing compassion to the patient too. So, okay, tell me what the voices are telling you and work with it and work with the patient how they can address those voices. It took a while for me to be able to get to the point where they do that, because first of all, it's all the things that you were saying, you know, the, the voices themselves are telling, don't talk about them. You'll be locked up. You'll be thrown. You'll be considered crazy. You'll be, you know, drugged, so, but, <laughs> drugged up. But if you can find somebody like a mother in your family or something where you can tell the mother what these things are saying, they absolutely hate it. They can't stand it. They want it to be a secret between you and them. They want to do everything possible to isolate you from your family, from your friends, from the entire human race, and just split you off, drive you into a room where you lock the door and you sit there and listen to them all day. That's what they want to accomplish. Oh, yeah. I stayed in my room for months at a time during some of this stuff. It's the worst thing a schizophrenic can do is lock themselves away and allow themselves to be bored. This is a battle for your spiritual attention. This is, it's a spiritual battle for your attention. And if you don't occupy your attention with positive stuff that you like, they're going to take it and they're going to put it where they want it. And that's not going to be a good place. Now, do you suggest, what if somebody doesn't have somebody to talk to? There could be a situation out there where they literally don't have somebody to confide oh, in. Would you recommend that they write down the things that are said to them so that they can look at it outside of themselves and really start analyzing, okay, this isn't me. Well, they, they mean, should be doing that in their head anyway. Okay. You know, it, it, the first step, like I said, the first step to recovery is realizing that these voices aren't you. They don't belong to you. They are not your thoughts. They are separate from you. Once you can do that, then you got an enemy that you can start fighting back against. You just need to figure out how to do it. So when you're talking with someone, you know, that saying, get it off your chest, where yeah. you're getting it out of you. So what I was thinking is that if you write it down, you are getting it out of you. You're telling the paper what's going on. Right? Keep a journal. Keep a journal. Yeah. Keep a journal I out. A book. I got a book of such writings there. And it, and it, a lot of times it looks like gibberish. It makes no sense. Yeah. I probably could dig it up at somewhere around here in one of these things behind me, but I got a, a book of drawings and writings and they, they just make no sense. They're incoherent. Was it helpful for that person to do that? Or you're saying, no, it wasn't. Well, I don't know. I, I know. got them. Uh, they, they drew these pictures. I'm sure it wouldn't be helpful if somebody found them. Yeah, exactly. You know, like yeah. Evidence against them. You know, yeah. look what he's doing. Look at this bizarre stuff. He is really whacked out. Well, so, like a face group, social support group, like others, and he's schizophrenic. Yeah, uh, matter of fact, group, Sherry, chat rooms yes, we, Sherry and I started one. There's 900 people in it now. It's on, uh, what do you call it? Facebook. I have to get the link from you. I'm trying to give people tools because not everybody has somebody to confide in, especially when it comes to something like this. And so it would be nice to offer that as a solution. It's a Facebook group. I'll get the link from you and I'll put it in the description. Okay. That's perfect. Thanks for bringing that up, Anand. That was great. Yeah, no they, problem. they have a place where they can talk to one another, Yeah, which helps greatly. But what's interesting, just irrespective of how much information we put on that group. Now, Facebook isn't great about keeping stuff up. It gets buried. But Sherry and I are constantly putting information on that group and they're not following through with it. Oh, okay. They don't have somebody like you that they're being held accountable to on a regular basis. Right. Is that you what know, it they, is? I, I don't know what it is. It, it boggles my mind because we're, we're constantly putting stuff up there. It I takes work the... and self-discipline to push through this yeah. stuff. I mean, I know what I went through. It was perseverance. You really had to become a spiritual warrior, so to speak, to, to fight your battle. And I think, like I said, Having that vision gave me the strength to continue on and to take on that battle and continue on with the fight. And look what you had to do to induce that vision. You said you intensely, let me go back, you intensely prayed for two weeks. That was a lot of discipline and dedication and intention that you were putting into, I want help with this. And 
I'm asking for it and I'm very serious about it. And I'm dedicating two weeks of your time. Yeah, I put two weeks of prayer led to the vis vision that occurred between two and 3 a.m. If you think about it, a lot of this conversation reminds me of somebody that would be an AA that would go through substance abuse. They're constantly within this battle of staying clean. And then even to get to the point where to go to the meeting, you're battling just even going there and doing that in the first place. Yeah, I, I, so I actually at the time I started going to some of those adult children of alcoholics, that sort of thing, some of those meetings because it was, hey, it was group therapy for me. You yeah. know, that, that, that's the way I approached it and it helped. And the voices don't want them going to anything. They don't want them getting help with anything. They'll block it, make excuses and distract them. So they have an arch enemy facing them that, mm -hmm. that is going to block anything they try to do to recover. But the good news is that you can, there is hope. You can recover from Oh, this. there is hope. It's not so like the psychiatric mafia says, you know, you know, this is a life sentence, not by a long shot. I mean, There's a lot of the, things you can do. Do you want to take the drugs and the tranquilizer the rest of your life? Or would you rather do the work and face the, the spiritual confrontations and re reprogramming the mind to, to get and, through it, And it does take work. It takes a lot of work, but it can be done. And then on your proof that it's something that you can tackle yourself, even though it is easier to tackle it with others. But you stepping forward and telling your story is proof that it is something that you can take on yourself. You can persevere and push through it and uh, you can ask for guidance. And if you're open to it, that guidance will come to you in more of a mystical type of experience. Right. And, you, you, um, everybody's got two guardian angels all the time. They can't help unless they're asked. They're yeah. not allowed. They can't interfere with your free will like these, these voices can. You said two guardian angels. Did you say specifically it, this is number two? Everybody's got at least two is what at I At least two. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And people who are, have bigger responsibilities, you know, they have more. And I've heard of I've heard of people completely recovering after just realizing that those voices aren't them. They're something else. Mm -hmm. And that's all it took. But that's it's a necessary first step. Yeah. And, and it's that coming to conclusion with that distinction is is pretty powerful from what I've, I've heard you talk about that a lot. Yeah, it's, it's uh, critical. It, it's and, enough to give you your sovereignty back. Is right. that what you would say? Well, it, it it's oh, enough definitely. to, yeah, it's enough to let you know that these things aren't you. Yeah, yeah, this is something else. And that's something that, you know, psychiatry is doing society a grave disservice by saying their brains are broken. These are, these are hallucinations. You're nuts. You got to take drugs for the rest of your life and you've got nothing to say about it. Can't speak up. We know what this is. We're the doctors. We're the experts. They're full of it. That's, that's ego. That's ego taking over. Mm -hmm. yeah. I have to ask you a question and on, do you anticipate ever maybe starting a group? Do you have a presence outside of doing these types of talks anonymously? Do you ever want to reach out and start a group we're getting people together to talk about these things i consider it you know i'm still i'm still working with chance engineer it's almost that fear of making that leap to transfer into something different you know this, this stage in life if i retire eventually or win the lottery maybe i will do a legitimately not not being offered numbers by these any of these evil entities um yes. then I, I may go down a certain path. I do hang out with some of these the Gnostic groups on Facebook and uh, on Discord a little bit to hear some of their experiences. You know, people looking at different metaphysical views on life and reality and philosophy. So I hang out there, but I haven't really worked in any type of groups out there. It's just time considerations. I'm, I'm still, mm -hmm. uh, I still got a, a family and uh, family obligations that take a lot of my time these days. Exactly. So it's tough to really do that much more. I, I definitely would like to reach out and do more in, in the future. I'm just not sure where my energy levels are as far as being able to, mm -hmm. to do that. I could definitely see you running a group of individuals where you introduce people to the way in which you could work on yourself to get to the point where you're at. You know, you have a very good presence about you, very good way of explaining things. And you come across as personable and you have this warm presence that would be welcoming to people that are looking for answers that maybe are not to where they require working with somebody like Jerry to get them to at least stable. If they're stable, they're within a couple years of 
being healed from this. And then they could stumble upon your group. And it would almost be like a, an AA for schizophrenics, like uh, recovering schizophrenics in a way, if you think about it, I could see you doing yeah. something like that. It would be Well, thank you. I might, I might look into that. You know, now that you mentioned there may be some, uh, you're right, because I think they have online AA groups, maybe online schizophrenic yeah. support groups type of thing. I, I, I may look into that. Yeah, because uh, it could even be those. like, Jerry, do they have support groups for families? that have family members that are schizophrenic, right? Well, I mean, we have one too. Janine yeah, okay. Florum is okay. running one on, uh, uh, she's got a group for family members of schizophrenics and she has a number of mothers in there. Okay. So that's a separate Facebook group from what you were talking yes. about before, correct? Okay. Right. I will send a reminder email to you to send me those links and I'll put them in the description. Don't, <laughs> don't you have people write you or not? Yeah, I do. I do have a website because I, 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 I Kind of discover this stuff upon writing a book on some of my experiences and religious experiences in general, kind of searching for one's soul. So I do have a website and a book that, that, I, that I have published. Excellent. Well, would you like to plug that? Sure. Okay. Um, well, this is this is the title of my book. It's called Revelations on Interstellar Highway 10, and it's available in paperback and ebook. Website what? is asteroxrising.com. Uh, it's spelled A S T E R. O X R I S I N G dot com. This book is written by an engineer, being me. And as you know, engineers cannot write. So uh, I, I mean, I could say that my daemon was influencing me on this, acting as my muse to kind of get this book out there. Right. But if anyone's interested, it. check check out the website. And if you're interested, I think it'll, it'll help those on their spiritual journey to kind of figure out, you know, what's life, what is life about, who am I, what am I doing here, where am I going. It, it, presents a lot of different religious perspectives on things and tries to help those on their own journey as well. Sherry and I have one too, called yeah. An Amazing I mean, I mean, Journey into the Psychotic Mind. It's been translated in French, Spanish, and uh, German at this point. You can get it from lulu.com or it's on Amazon. And my website is jerrymarzinski.com. And... Uh, but there's a lot of good information in the articles section there that people who can't afford therapy can get information to start the work of recovery. And then, so Anon, do people can contact you through your website, right? Correct. That's correct. I will make sure both of those websites are in the description as well as links to get your books, the two Facebook groups that you mentioned. And I think we covered a lot. It's been almost two hours now that we've been talking. Uh, I'm glad um, you're having fun. I know it. And I just want to thank you both again for coming on to the show. Thank you, Jerry. This is the fourth time. And this is the second time you've brought somebody with you. Do either of you want to finish this out with something, any type of advice or further information? that you want to leave people with? Jerry, do you have anything that you could point people to on your website specifically? Well, specifically, I think one of the most powerful single programs that we have was, you know, I was aware of it. Sherry Sweeney took it and developed it into a masterpiece. It's called the That's a Lie program. It would benefit any schizophrenic who's hearing voices. Take that and put it to work consistently every time the voices show up. And it will lower their level, if not, in some cases, it's actually gotten totally rid of them. Just that one program alone. Now, there's a, a lot more that can be done, but that's the basics along with understanding that these voices are not you. They don't belong to you. They come from a, a, another place, and it's not a good place, and that they're not your friends. A lot of times they try to uh, they they start out like, oh, where were your friends? We're a spiritual force. We can help you. We're magical, that kind of stuff. And once they get you to trust them and you let them in, then they hook you. Yeah, they can act like bullies. And there's both positive and negative entities out there. Some are looking out for our interests. Some are not looking out for our best interests. But it's tough to apply discernment to figure out which is which. Well, I found that positive ones seldom speak literally with words until the person's on the verge of death or being in trouble. They usually communicate through serendipity, feelings, and intuition. You know, a lot of the time, the bad ones, you'll hear a voice come into your head like, why don't you do this? And you know, it's something's going to get you in trouble. They hit us all to different degrees. They're bullies oh. and gangsters. 
That's right. Nobody's immune from them. I think that we are going to end on that note. And I want to thank you two again for coming on to the show. Jerry, you're welcome to bring anyone else to tell their story. And thank you again, Anon. I really appreciate it. I wish you all the luck with your book, the website, and your future, and your continued healing with all of this. Thank you both. I'm going to stop recording.